Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Property Question Time. Special because it is a finance special. So if you want lots of interesting tips and clues on how to make lots of money, you're in the right place. And we've got three special guests who are all financial property experts to answer lots of questions that they haven't seen before. So this really is putting them on the spot, but I've got a feeling they're all going to be absolutely fine under the pressure. So my first guest is Tony Gimple, and Tony is the co-founder of Less Tax for Landlords. And then next up, we have a, a regular face here on Property TV. It's Paul Mahoney, the managing director of Nova Financial. And last but not least, of course, James Jenkins from Money Sprite. And James is, of course, a financial advisor. So are you ready, chaps? We are going to be putting your knowledge to the test, but also, you know, this is going to be the kind of information that people out there who are interested in property are going to be probably scribbling down on a notebook. So let's kick off. And these questions are for all of you. So this first question uh, is from somebody who's saying this. We're currently selling our flat, which is in London, and we were supposed to exchange last week, but then suddenly heard that the buyer's mortgage was rejected. And that is because our ground rent will double in 25 years from £200 a year to £400 a year. And now his solicitor has told us that our flat is unmortgageable. My solicitor says that's nonsense. There will be a mortgage out there. But we're looking at asking the landlord for a deed of variation. So can anybody help me understand this? How is £200 on 25 years seen as untenable? And any idea of rough time frame, cost of deed of variation? Anybody who wants to kick things off? James. I can kick things off. I've had a case very similar where I was acting for the buyer in mm. that scenario. Um, it's becoming increasingly common. Um, with lenders having problems with leaseholds and doubling ground rents. Now, yes. this one, it's 200 doubling in 25 years to 400 and so on and so on. And I'm assuming yeah. there's sort of a 125 year lease. Yeah. It's absolutely plausible the mortgage lenders pulled the mortgage off for that reason. That's the first thing. But it's not every lender is going to say no to that. Okay. Um, it really does depend on, on the individual lender. The issue is when a little while back sort of new build um, leaseholds came up with a massive issue around about doubling ground rents every 10 years. Um, and as a result of all, all that, a lot of lenders pulled out of lending on those bases, but also said, right, we're not doing any doubling ground rents. Sort of very much a, a broad approach to the whole market. Because if I'm correct, wasn't it like dolphin clauses, they called it or something? And yes. I think that if people were not spending much on a property comparatively, they could end up paying like a third of the... You know, yeah, the they were cost of the, you know, huge extortionate Yeah, amounts. the ground rents were going up sort of 30, 40,000 pounds and things like that yeah. at, the end of, at the end of term. Now, if you think logically on that one, over a 125 year lease, if it doubles every 25 years, in 125 years time, the ground rent will be 4,000 pounds for the year. Mm. And we'll all be dead. Uh, we'll all be dead. Yeah. Um, but also 4,000 pounds in 125 years is probably going to be roughly worth about 200 pounds today. So it's right. not yeah. th that different to what it is in today's, today's money. Now, there are lenders out there that will lend on that basis. Okay. The second part to the question is uh, about the, the deed time of frame, variation. Yeah, the cost of deed of variation. That's, that's more, far more a legal area than any of us are, are involved in. However, deed of variation, as with anything to do with law, how long is a piece mm. of string? Um, mm. If a landlord's particularly good at responding and so on and so forth, then it could be relatively quick. But what you've got to bear in mind, if the landlord's going to issue a deed of variation on your flat, he's got to be prepared to do it on all the flats in, in the block that they own, mm -hmm. um, and whether the landlord wants to do that. So it, it, quite often, more often than not, and in the case that I had recently when mm. we were acting, they went to the landlord, about four weeks later we heard back from the landlord, no, not prepared to do a deed of variation. Right. End, end done. Okay. Um, and also when it comes to the costings, well, obviously, if, if he does agree to a variation, invariably you're going to be the one picking up the cost for his legal bills, your legal bills as well. So it's likely to be a, a, a relatively costly process. Most often is, is making sure that when somebody's buying a leasehold flat or selling a leasehold flat, they, they, if they're selling it, volunteer up this ground rent clause day one so that the buyer can be in a position to make sure that the mortgage they get is going to, to suit. Okay. Now, the issue we've got around it being unmortgageable um, is... As there is a bit of a trend for lenders to be pulling back from this, if you're to buy a flat with that kind of clause on it, mm. where lenders are starting to pull out withdrawing, you may be the person that buys it and it ends up 
with an unmortgageable flat yeah. if everybody follows suit. Now I do think we're likely to find a lot more um, real world thinking from lenders on these as these sort of really extreme examples of, of it's not really a problem become more common right. and, and more sort of toning down to not lending on specific sort of the new build ones, the 10 year doubling leases and yeah. things like that. So at the moment you think that this is a symptom of people who are just going, don't go near them full stop. Oh, it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment, yeah, isn't it? You know, it the is. issues that have been around leasehold and, and concerns there. And, you know, I think it is the, the extreme examples that have been in the media, um, which kind of gets everyone a bit scared. But mm. I suppose what's important is to understand the, the lease, you know, what, what's involved. Um, yeah, that's one particular term, that, so far as the ground rent doubling after 25 years. Another is sometimes it will increase with inflation after a certain period of time. Which seems reasonable. Which is more, pretty reasonable yeah. and, and is probably pretty similar to mm. doubling over 25 years, you know, mm. inflation around two or three percent. Um, that probably is doubling, you know, I think it is there or thereabouts doubling over 20 years. Okay. Um, and, and lenders for some reason seem a bit more comfortable with that, even though it's the same thing. Um, okay. I suppose, and that's the point to understand there is lenders don't have to say yes. You know, it's their money. It's their money, yeah. So we um, forget that sometimes, don't so, we? So they don't necessarily have to be very logical. And a yeah. lot of time they're not, unfortunately. Right. Um, so it's important to understand that. You know, it might seem unfair sometimes the lender says no and they may not give you a reason or the reason they give you may not seem very logical. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's their call. Okay. Um, but I suppose the upside is there are lots of lenders out there and there's lots of products within each lender. So um, if one lender says no, there's probably another that will say yes. But in this instance, their buyers are probably going to pull out, aren't they? Because they've been told by their solicitor, no. So that is stressful for the people selling, isn't it? When to them, it looks you know, not unreasonable. Yeah, the solicitor's invariably act, is acting for the, for the buyer and he's going to advise his client the best way that, that he sees. And if he thinks that the advice or the information he's getting is that lenders are not going to be lending on this, he's going to advise his client it's not mortgageable and therefore not to proceed so he doesn't get caught out mm. two years, three years down the line when he comes to try and sell. Mm. Which is a shame really. You know, I think yeah. sometimes solicitors try to cover themselves too much um, and therefore that they're acting in the best interest of their client, maybe this person is going to miss out on that property that they really yeah, want love, yeah. because the solicitor is covering themselves. Yeah. Um, I would so be concerned about 25 years. I, I, Personally, I think if I was buying, I would question it. Well, no, well, no maybe a good idea then for the, for the seller may be to, for them to go and talk to a, a mortgage advisor and mm. say, look, this is a situation, where would you be able to put it? Where would you be able to place it? So that when yeah, you no, know how many yeah. lenders potentially are, are out there, so that, that those answers are almost pre-prepared for the, for the new buyer, that yes. you know, we know that seven lenders here will, will lend on that property, but if you look at it there, they won't lend. And there's no... There's no negatives to that because what you can do is save yourself a lot of heartache down the line with suddenly somebody getting just before exchange of contracts mm. and pulling out because let's be fair as a mortgage broker, nine times out of ten when we sit down with a client to do a mortgage application on a property, when you're coming to me to buy a property, you generally don't know the terms of the lease at that point. So I can ask all the questions under the sun, is it a doubling ground rent and so on and so forth. And invariably yourself and, and more often as well the estate agents, they don't really know. Mm. Um, it's only as that pack comes out. To, the, to their solicitor that, oh, hold on, it is a doubling ground rent clause. So right. we can do a lot of work one direction mm. and then have to pull back and go another way or find out that actually if, if only that lender fits that client's income expenditure and circumstances, yeah. then actually you're not going to be able to buy that flat because this is your only choice as a mortgage lender. Mm. So it, as a seller of, of a flat with that kind of clause, I, I don't see any negatives to you spending a bit of time just with a mortgage advisor. I'm mm. assuming you're buying on, you're probably going to have your own mortgage advisor anyway. Yeah. Just say, look, can you do... A little bit of work. Tell me who would lend on this. Yeah, it's terrible, really. It's been like the sort of PPI scandal of the, of the property world, hasn't it? And in some of those extreme instances, it actually meant people kind of losing their home in the yeah. very ex worst yeah. cases. You can understand why people don't want to go anywhere near it with a barge pole because it's just awful and pretty scandalous, really. Yeah, exactly. But it's an extreme example it, yeah. versus what's versus this, normal, which is, I guess. If you look at it logically, yeah. sit and do the maths. And these aren't, a lot of these are not new build flats. These are flats that were built in the 1960s, yes. 1970s. Yeah. yeah. They've been bought and sold countless times. And some before. of those really bad examples, I think the ground rent was doubling every year. Yes. So that very quickly, if you sit down with the calculator, spirals yeah. off. There were some examples of where there was no stipulation of how much it can increase by. Yeah. So that the ground rent can be sold on and that person who buys the ground rent can make it whatever they like, um, which obviously isn't ideal. Yeah, terrible. There's also an, 
underlying problem, not directly connected, but with how professional advice is asked for and delivered. Mm. The professions, generally speaking, don't like to give advice. Uh, advice equals risk, and they will only ask that answer that which you've asked them. Mm -hmm. You need to find advisors who are prepared to look at things completely in the round and point out what may be mm. unintended consequences of what it is you're doing. You know, so, so you have got a ground rent that is increasing periodically. Mm. They should tell you, look, have you actually seen this? You know, there is no stipulated amount. That's unusual. The consequences to this, to you, are. Yeah. Isn't it, don't you expect usually your solicitor to find this out? Though? Well, but bear in mind, they're probably not going to get that until they've had, first of all, the member himself from the estate agent. Right. And then the contract's pack in from the other side if they've been forthcoming with the information. Yeah. Okay. But what you've got to remember is that, uh, invariably, the minute the, the, the sales agreed, the estate agents all over the, the buyer to get survey instructions, where's your mortgage, mm. where's your mortgage, mm. where's your mortgage? So they're starting to spend money before this kind of information landed at their solicitor's <laughs> desk. Yeah. And then the problem comes up, and that's why, and we're, we're talking to our clients a lot about that now when they're buying flats, is saying, you know, what's the ground rent? Is there any doubling ground rent before we do the mortgage application? Mm. Mm. And then we're trying to find out from the, the estate agent before, before any offers have been made, etc. Sort of yeah, yeah, they've gone and invested. What's important to keep in mind there as well is often solicitors will point these things out, mm. but they won't interpret them. Okay. Um, yes. So they'll tell you the risk, which might scare you. Yeah. And then you're scared. Yeah. And you don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> and the solicitor won't take a commercial view on those things, whereas perhaps you should be. Mm -hmm. So you know, whether you do that yourself, or again, whether you seek other advice outside of the solicitor to help guide you through that, and yeah. you know, what is really a red flag, what is really a risk, and what is just the solicitor saying, you know, this is black and white. Yeah, guys, we've done a whole quarter of the show just on that question, because it is such a massive topic. So thank you so much, and join us in the next section of this Property Question Time financial special. Welcome back to the second part of this Property Question Time special. It's an hour-long finance special with me, Gemma Forte, thank goodness I'm not the expert, and Tony Gimple, Paul Mahoney, and James Jenkins. These are our finance specialists. So, more questions, let's get cracking. We've got one here, and it's for all of you, and bearing in mind our experts have not seen these questions as well, so we're really putting them in the hot seat. Somebody here says, I'm looking to take over my parents' property and remaining balance on the mortgage, but with a new provider. Vaguely, the property is valued around 60 to 70,000, with about 35 of that left to be paid. From a legal perspective, is this likely to be classed as a straightforward buy and sell or something more intricate as gifted equity? Now, it doesn't state, obviously, whether the parents are still around necessarily, but what do you make of this, Tony? What we don't know is why they're thinking of doing it. Mm. Are the parents still going to be living there? Mm. Is it for some other purpose? It could be fraught with complications. Although the numbers in this example are relatively small, uh, it could well bring about inheritance tax. Okay. So um, if, if the parents are still living in the property and benefiting from that, that could be classed as a gift with reservation of benefit. So okay. they're not paying a market rent for their, you know, to, li to live in the property, yeah. therefore it's still in their estate for inheritance tax purposes. Okay. It's also in their son's estate, both for capital gains tax, if he's not living there, it's now an investment property. Any income he generates from that will be subject to taxes. And it's in his estate from an inheritance tax perspective as well. Wow, it's complicated, isn't it? it it's a complex question, very simply worded. Okay. And, and there's, there's even more complexity to it. If the son now owns the property, mum and dad are living there, what happens if something goes wrong in the son's life? Uh, bad marriage, bad relationship, financial difficulties. Suddenly, mum and dad could be out of the house. So it's not really a question about whether it should be a mortgage, a sale, equity transfer. Mm. It's really getting underneath why it's happening and what they're trying to achieve. Gosh, I mean, yeah. I think this is why people get so stressed about the yeah. issue of inheritance tax, etc. I think what a little bit more detail mean? would make that question a lot more simple. Yeah. Right, Because, okay. you know, as Tony said, whether the parents are still around, whether they're living in the property, 
whether the, the son, is it the son? Yeah. Is taking over the property, is living there, um, and whether that's with the parents or without the parents. Yeah. You know, all those scenarios are very different and, and you know, um, raise different you know, things that need to be considered. Yeah, actually, the, 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 there's quite a general point there. You know, as professionals, experts, whatever, we, we all get asked questions and expected you know, to give answers on the spot without really understanding what was behind the question. And going back to what we talked about in the uh, earlier segment, it's really, really important to always ask you know, of that person, mm. why? Why, yeah. The hows are immaterial. It's the what, why do you want to do this? What are you trying to achieve? Then we can start to give some meaningful well, what's responses. What's quite interesting is, what's great is we do get a lot of questions through here and they'll be sometimes that long. <laughs> Which for me is like blah, blah, blah. But it's great because the more detail, you know, well, Sometimes the, the longer questions give you a yes or no answer. And it's very, very... Yeah. Actually, the shorter <laughs> questions are the ones where you, you, you're sort of guessing. I mean, what I would add on that, that point is we, from a technical point of view, in terms of getting that that mortgage yeah. th and whether it affects things or not yes parents living there not living there that's all important is it the son's second property first property does he own elsewhere they're all questions that need to be answered in terms of the technicalities of the actual question of you know is it a straightforward buy and sell or is it a gifted equity depends which way they're doing it so son can a son can buy from parents and give them deposit and buy it like a normal sell and buy but you can also do a concessionary purchase which would be a gift of equity Mm. whereby effectively you're, you're, in theory, buying the property for what the current mortgage is, the mortgage amount, almost 100%. And then oh, the, right. the, the equity yeah. is gifted, so you don't have to put any physical money down. It's a family-to-family -family transaction. Oh. So in this scenario, he's got, say, 50% mortgage. Be not a good thing to do then? Oh, I see. So then he inherits the value yes. of the so property. Yes, so effectively, although he, yeah. he gets a 50% mortgage, yes. he, it, the property's worth this much. Yes. So in a year, two years' time, when he comes to remortgage, he can remortgage and take money out of it if he needs yeah. to because there's equity in there. Assuming so that's another the way of doing it. Give consent at that point. Well, yeah. yes. Um, now the other part is they don't necessarily have to sell it. They could, in theory, um, look to maybe remortgage and add him to the mortgage if what they're looking to do is just to maybe if they get into the end of, of a mortgage term and they're maybe too old to get a mortgage in their own right, mm -hmm. it maybe they're looking towards a son who's maybe working and, and younger to get a longer term on that mortgage so they don't have to sell and go into, into a home or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there are mortgage lenders out there that he could just transfer on a, on a remortgage rather than buy it or sell it. So they still retain ownership of the property. He gets added to the mortgage and some lenders will actually take as long as he's earning sufficiently yeah. and we don't need the parents' income, they'll then base the mortgage term on his age and right. therefore they can get longer on that mortgage term yeah. without having to worry too much about the, the sale and purchase as a gifted equity yeah. or whatever and without them losing the, the, the ownership of that property. Yeah, There is a point in your life where it becomes very insulting when you go to get a mortgage and they go, well, we'll only give you this because of your age. You're like, what? <laughs> what are you saying? I was like, oh. Very insulted. <laughs> I think I've got 23 years or something. It's like a something that to old. be conscious of, just on the point there. Um, if the son is getting involved just for a serviceability or an affordability perspective to help the parents out, mm. and the son's not living there, that could have a big impact on him being able to get a mortgage anywhere else. Yeah. So, right. you know, that, that scenario, in my opinion, would only really work if the son is living with the parents in the property. Interesting. Um, yeah. Or if the parents move, move out. Yeah. If the son's not living there, then he, he would be you know, severely handicapping himself by helping the parents out with their mortgage. Yeah, okay. So, gosh, I mean, this is why you need to go and get professional advice, isn't it? Because there's so much to consider that I think most people, it's too much. It's too much. I to think Tony's point is as long as you know why they're doing it, then actually the answer is much more simple. Right. I think we've made it sound probably more complicated and frightening than it is because we don't know the right, reason exactly. why. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we're sort of saying if it's this and if it's that. Yeah, and okay. It's almost that they need professional counselling as opposed to professional advice because <laughs> you know, a counsellor was asking, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> I've got you. Okay, thank you. So there you go as well. If you're sending in questions to us, more detail, the better. So we've got another question here. This person, I'm not sure whether it's a man or woman, says, um, I'm curious to know if there are any advantages or disadvantages of adding my two buy-to-let properties into my personal pension. If it's advantageous, how do I go about it? I'm 45 years old and both buy-to-lets are mortgaged. Well, there's a, a fundamental and underlying problem there. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, does he have sufficient, or her, she have sufficient pensionable income? 
okay. and if they're residential properties, mm. um, well, I'm not a financial advisor, my understanding is that they can't go into pension funds. All right. Okay. Is that the... Do Just to clarify that, they can, oh, okay. but you, you get taxed at 55%. Oh, well, hey. So they can, <laughs> yeah. but um, it's not worth it. No. They, right. they, they, they tax you to the point where it doesn't make any sense. sense. Oh, yeah. okie dokie. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if they were commercial properties, self-invested pension, right. lots and lots of tax breaks, very efficient, very efficient for inheritance tax, yeah. and could well be a good idea okay. based on the, what the overall situation is though. Well, I would say that probably answers that question then, doesn't it? Probably just don't, it's not worth it. Assuming that, that they're talking about residential buy to let, yeah, which they probably are. Yeah. If, if they're commercial, you know, for example, if they're mm. something like student accommodation, care yeah. homes, hotel rooms, yeah. right. you know, that's, that's considered commercial property, that yeah. could go into a pension. Okay. And also, it's a bit of a contradictory question. Mm. If you've got rental properties, commercial or otherwise, producing an income, from an amount of capital employed, that is a pension by any other name. And right. is the yield yeah. you know, from the rents going to be higher than an annuity rate in a pension? Yeah. Because bear in mind, you, you're giving up the capital value you know, when you buy an annuity, yeah. whereas you're still keeping the capital value if, you, if you've got the houses and the income they produce in your own name. Yeah, and I guess also then that income, although you save it, if you want to use it as a pension, you can get to it when you want, because that's... The thing with pensions, it tends to be locked in, doesn't it? Correct, yeah. Yeah, I'm always trying to get at mine. I assume they're looking at doing that to put it into a more tax-effective environment, you know. Right. Uh, but generally, when people are getting toward the, the age of retirement, the, the income from your investments will be your main source of income anyway. Yeah. So aside from that income, you'd be a low tax, sorry, a basic rate taxpayer. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's relatively tax efficient to have them in your own name anyway. Okay. Yeah. Oh. There are things to look at in the bigger picture, but yeah. Okay, Indra, thank you so much. I think that's answered that very, very succinctly. Right, you are indeed watching Property Question Time. This is a finance special, so stay tuned and we'll see you after this short break. It's part three of this special property question time. It's a finance special with me, Gemma Forte, and my three experts who haven't seen the questions before. And my industry experts are Tony Gimple, Paul Mahoney, and James Jenkins. So, here we go with the next question, fellas. It's for all of you. Just arranging a remortgage at the moment, but I'm getting a hard sell to take out MPPI, specifically a decreasing term assurance critical illness cover over an 18 year term. The remaining amount on my mortgage is about 150K. I've got no dependents, I'm single. I've got enough in savings to tide me over for mortgage payments for two years. And my work offers four times my salary if I pop my clogs whilst in employment. Who does it go to if you're dead? Anyway, do I need the cover the broker is suggesting? Well, your point there about who does it go to if you're dead, it, what I was gonna say is yeah. the death in services is irrelevant in this question because it's, yes. it's paid on death, not critical illness. Yeah. And there's a big, big difference. As critical illnesses, you get cancers, tumours, strokes, heart disease. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to die. So two, two areas to look at here. First, I don't really like the term hard sell. So it would be an, it, interesting to see what that hard sell looks like. It's yeah. not the right way to provide insurance to a client. Is that not how you would do I it? I wouldn't do it on a no. hard sell basis. It, it's a basis of talking to a client about what their current situation is, what their current setup is, where their need areas are, yeah. because our jobs as advisors are to tell people where their shortfall areas are, not to just say, well, what do you want? So this is what your need area is. It's, it's critical illness. Now for her, um, I assume it's her basis. Um, I don't know why I assumed her, but, but for this person, mm -hmm. um, she's got two years worth of mortgage payments saved up mm -hmm. uh, and death in service, which, which is irrelevant in the critical illness question. So that's all well and good. But if she gets a critical illness, she's going to have to pay the mortgage. What's she going to live off, off the back of that? Mm. So if she can pay her mortgage for two years, that's fantastic. Yeah. What about living costs? So assuming that she's not going to be able to work potentially because of this critical illness. Mm. Now, what she should be looking at, and, and a critical illness policy is exactly the right kind of cover to, to look at, is increasing term insurance policy, which is what they've recommended, that's going to mean that if she's diagnosed with one of these conditions, she's going to get a payout, she can pay her mortgage off, then that money she's got saved up it's going to be her money to live off. And it may mean because she hasn't got to pay a mortgage out of that now, that money will last longer than two years. Okay. All the research shows that people who don't have to worry about finance so much when they get diagnosed with a critical illness, 
make a far better recovery mm, and yeah. also they are less likely to relapse on what it is they've had so heart attacks less likely to have a heart attack again because you haven't got to worry about the stress not stressed about exactly the mortgage yeah. so i think i would agree with what the advisor is trying to say here in terms of that's the area that she should be considering i think maybe it's the way they've gone about it in terms mm. of the hard sell rather than actually talking to them and explaining the benefits and where it fits into their current planning scenario. Planning is the yeah. thing that is difficult for people to confront and talk about because you're essentially saying you might have a heart attack or get cancer or something, which is obviously the last thing any of us want to think about. And yet, of course, it, you know, it could be anybody. So it is a strange thing to talk about sometimes. Well, the latest figures are one in two people will get cancer at some point in their lives. So that means there's four of us sat around the table, so two of us are, are nailed on. Yeah. Um, but but it, that's what makes yeah. the conversations awkward because it, it's real world, it does happen. Yeah. Yeah. As an advisor, it's always a really difficult conversation to have with somebody, particularly somebody who maybe sort of thinks they're bulletproof. Mm. And it is difficult to try and not cross that line between saying somebody sort of scaremongering, scaremongering yeah. but yeah. also getting them to understand that this is real world um, issues that need to be dealt with. So I think, the, the, as I say, the issue really there is, is not so much what it is that he's talking about. Mm. It sounds more like how he's going about it and the way that some advisors do deal with the cover is rather than spend an hour talking to a client about the benefits, about how it fits, what it really means, what the claims payout records are. I mean, 94% is sort of the average payout on critical illness. So there's a good record that insurers really? pay out on these claims. Okay. Um, so what you will have um, an amount guaranteed kind of thing if you get X, Y or Z. But also, it, I think where people worry is like, obviously with any insurance, you hope you never see that money again. Mm. It's just a waste if you like. That's what you want. Um, but if it happens and you make a claim, I think what people are scared about is like, but is there a small point where if I get X, they won't pay? Whereas if I get X, they will. And that, you can't yeah. list all the diseases that you could possibly get. And with critical illness, you know, looking at some of those figures, one in two people will get cancer. Most critical illness will cover if most, if not all, cancer. So yeah. you know, that there's a pretty high likelihood that you're going to claim on something like that. Mm. And, and in fact, make money from it, you know, which just, as James so was saying, softens the blow. So they'll give you more than you might need in yeah. that period? Uh, no, I think we're saying is in terms of what you've paid for the cover. Yeah, depending, okay. obviously you might be paying 10 quid a month or something and it might pay a couple hundred thousand pounds, right, okay. um, depending on what that critical illness is. So it's almost a no-brainer to have it, given that yeah. you know it's pretty likely that you might have to claim it, even though it's a terrible thought to have. Have you all got it? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> what, what you said yes. then about the list is, is all insurers will provide a list of what they do cover and what the medical diagnosis and definitions are below that. So okay. The, the biggest issue with, with insurance is, is cost versus benefit or perceived benefit to a client. If it cost a pound a month, everyone would have that cover. Mm. No, no questions asked at all, but, but these things don't cost a pound a month. No. They cost based on risk, based on your age, health, okay. likelihood of, of getting it, family history, and it's costed out like all insurance, it's risk, risk costed. Mm. So it's about cost versus benefit, and it could be, I think the biggest issue is trying to help this, this client understand benefit versus cost and where it fits in. Ultimately, when it comes to a mortgage, life insurance, critical illness cover, none of those are compulsory to get the mortgage through. So if she really doesn't understand the benefits or want them, she can, she can not have them. Okay, so if them. you've got critical illness, so in other words, the bank don't insist on it Correct. because if you couldn't pay your mortgage, they would just take, take the house back. back. Yeah, okay, you don't want that, do you, in that situation? So, very interesting, so in other words, I think, would you all agree that probably critical illness cover in this person's case, despite having no dependents or anything like that, thinking of themselves yeah. is a good thing to have yeah. yep. and to think about, um, but that maybe a hard sell makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. There's a fine line, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. What it was and how it was perceived could be two different things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yes. Okay. Making me think about all sorts of things, I must say. <laughs> okay, we've just got time for another one. Somebody here says, we bought a buy to let and got the keys a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations. Two days later, oh, we found out about problem neighbours, which wasn't declared by the previous owners. So we are very annoyed and want to sell on. As it was a second property, we had to pay the Scottish equivalent of stamp duty. Do you know if we can get a refund given that it's not our main original residence that we're selling? On the refund on the stamp oh, duty. on the stamp duty. I don't think you can because it's not selling a main residence. Uh, no, and it's Scottish to boot, so is yes. Any, is there rules. any recourse for someone who hasn't declared a problem neighbour? 
What is a problem neighbour? Well, what I don't know. They obviously that? really are problem neighbours if two days later... Like how do you define a problem neighbour? I right. guess it's it might noisy, not a problem for anti-social behaviour. I don't know. I suppose <sighs> can't really define it, no, can you? Because right. so a problem to some person isn't a problem to the next. Right. Yeah, because the people who sold it have said we never had a problem. Yeah, we like it exactly. Maybe they're they're mates. Half but isn't, them, you there, don't know. Yeah. isn't there a contingency clause there that no. if, if you've complained about these people to the council That's assuming for, they have. for noise and stuff, but if you have, then you yeah. have to yes. declare that, don't you? Yes. But it, if you haven't, if you've lived with it, and then it's not, it's not a problem there's no for recourse. You. No. Yeah, if yeah. there's no problem for you, you can't declare a problem. And then there isn't going to be a recourse because that's the new person's opinion that it's a problem. I feel really sorry for people who have antisocial neighbours, and I'd assume mm. that if they found out two days later, there must be something quite bad going on next door. Uh, quite possibly, mm. but actually proving that somebody deliberately withheld it, that it was material to them making the purchase, mm. you know, you're, you know, you're in a bottomless pit of legal fees. Okay. Yeah, the most likely scenario is what you do is you go back to your solicitor, you get them to raise it, as I say, on the other side, mm. and then if you're going to pursue it any further, you look at litigation. Yeah. So it, it's not a matter that's going to be sorted out between the two conveyancing solicitors. Okay, Correct. all right, then. interesting. So just to absolutely clarify as well, if you had, and I don't know if this is your area of expertise, but if you had um, um, neighbours and they're having parties most nights doing your head in, you work night shifts, absolute nightmare, and you phone up noise pollution at the council, do you legally have to declare that when you're selling the house? As so far as I know, I don't think you, so. You don't no. think so? No. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's something that I would want to know. And I think it's really interesting when you go and view a property. There are so many things you can't mm. possibly yep. find out till you live in it. And that is one of them. Do your research. You know, do a bit of mystery shopper. You know, um, Knock on some neighbours' doors and say, "Hey, what is it, what is it like to What's live?" What's it like? Yeah, you get And the truth. there's be guarantee that one person will be very happy to talk to you and, and give you the lowdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the it entire neighbourhood. It's very a much difference. a buyer beware, isn't it? it, buyer is, beware. You, it you can't be protected against every single possible no. situation that may have arisen at some point in the last twenty years. But yeah, yeah, yeah boundary disputes, things like that, are usually a lot easier to pick up yeah. because you know, they'll yeah. be logged and registered. But but yeah, things like the complaints are uh, yeah, go and do some research, drive around at night, see what it's like at night. Have you yeah. got people you know, skateboarding mm. on your front wall, or is it a nice peaceful? Yeah. I like that. Is it a nice peaceful <laughs> neighbourhood? Do you know what I mean? You go yeah. and do these bits. Don't just just rely on what somebody's told exactly. you. Yeah, yeah. I do have a friend who was in a situation where he shared a lease with somebody who was incredibly ill and um, they ha kept their flat in a very, shall we say, not a great way. Like you open the door and it was really, and he worries a lot about selling his flat in the yeah, future. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's tricky. Anyway, thank you for that. That's very interesting. So um, yeah, I'm afraid nothing you can do. But they might sell the property on and then they don't have to claim it either, do they? So this property could just be sold. Well, yeah, that's, that's the question. Every six to eight weeks. Theoretically, are they going to then note that on their sales and they're selling it because there's nightmare neighbours? Oh, I would yeah. imagine they probably won't be. Yeah, yeah. 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 But they wouldn't be able to claim their stamp duty back, we don't think, is the no. other part of the question. Because the only way to claim the back is if you've paid it when you hadn't sold so the main residence. on buying a property, isn't well, yeah, it? which so they you, have so done. Yes, but when you buy a second property, you pay a, a levy of 3% stamp duty as a, as a second home or second okay. property. Um, and, but there is a clause that if, say, for example, you sell your main residence mm. within three years of buying that then and move into that one as your new main residence, yeah. then you can claim back the extra stamp duty. Is it three years? Yeah, three years. You can claim back the 3% extra you paid. Mm. And I think what they're asking is, because we're selling this property within three years, yeah. can we claim it back? And the answer is no, because they're not selling the main residence. They're just selling the investment that they bought. Okay. And it's All a transactional right. tax. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of part three out of four of this property question time special. See you after the break. Welcome back to this final section of our hour-long finance special of Property Question Time with me, Gemma Forte, and my three industry experts who are busy answering all of your quite complex questions in a nice, clear way that we can all understand, even me. So I'm joined today by Tony Gimple, Paul Mahoney, and James Jenkins. Uh, gentlemen, this is your question. And bear in mind, they haven't seen this before either. It's good stuff. This person says, I've been lucky enough to pay off my mortgage early and I called my insurance provider to check 
what happens to my mortgage protection now? I was told it wasn't attached to the mortgage, so if I die, there'll still be a payout to my estate, reducing year by year. Now, I'm quite happy to continue paying if this is the case, but I can't find anything in my terms and conditions to confirm it. Does anyone know if this is usual for a mortgage term life assurance? Yes. Okay. I do. Right. Um, that's completely normal. Is it? Uh, yeah. Okay. The, the, invariably, the mortgage and the insurance company, two entirely separate entities, mm. neither knows about the other one. What happens is, is when your advisor sets up your mortgage protection policy, it is linked to the mortgage, but only yeah. in so much as how we've designed it. So in terms of the sum assured day one, how long the policy is going to run for, mm. whether it's decreasing if you've got a repayment mortgage or level if you've got a, uh, an interest only mortgage. Right. So it's linked to the mortgage in that respect in terms mm -hmm. of just its design. It's not actually, the payout doesn't go to the insurance company. So if you died, it doesn't, sorry, to the mortgage company, it doesn't go over there. If, if something happened, the payout comes to, to you for you to do something with it. So the fact you've paid your mortgage off is completely irrelevant. The insurance company is, is, is no... But you've also got to, to keep paying it, even though you haven't got the No, mortgage. you haven't got to. No, she's opted to. You can right. stop an insurance policy, whether it's mortgage related or not, at any point. Oh. There's no penalties to shop, stop an insurance policy, not like a mortgage. If you come out of that early, you'll pay an early repayment charge. Yeah. When it comes to an insurance policy, the only penalty by not paying for it is you won't have the cover anymore. Yeah, okay. So if you want the cover, which it sounds like she does, then it's absolutely, completely, it won't be anything in terms of conditions because it's it's just a completely different policy from a separate company completely to your mortgage. So oh, okay. that policy can run independently and for as long as she wants to or until it ends. It's the, the name of the policy that's causing yeah. a bit exactly. of confusion. The yeah. fact that the reason they took it out was to cover the mortgage doesn't actually mean it's anything to do with the mortgage. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would be exactly the same <laughs> as her. I'd be like, mortgage term life assurance is linked to it, but it's not, you learn something new every day. Right, I've got another one here and it's a free for all. So, uh, this person says, I'm in a position where I only need £8,000 to purchase my property and I'd like to get a loan for this amount and pay it off over 30 months. Can you legally get a loan for this or does it have to be a mortgage? Yeah. I think if it's only yeah. £8,000, you, you could, yeah? As long as you've got a loan company who's willing to lend you the money, then Then, then yeah. it's your money, It's not yeah. secured. The only problem you have with loans when it comes to buying properties is if, you need, if you're trying to use it as a deposit for a purchase and you're going right. to get a mortgage for the balance because yeah. then that's going to come into play with affordability yeah. and some lenders will have an issue with you borrowing money to put down a deposit so you can borrow more money. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if, he's, if they're buying cash and they're just £8,000 short, as long as they can get a loan to do it, then, then yeah, there's no problem at all. Have there's no go. third party telling them they can't. Means, yeah. Okay. Um, this person says, I'm releasing equity from my property by putting a buy to let mortgage on it. The equity will be used to fund a deposit on a second property. And the second property requires full renovation. Can I live in the buy to let property temporarily for three months whilst the new place is renovated? What do you think, Paul? Well, most buy to let mortgage terms wouldn't allow that. Mm. Um, you know, you could probably risk it and they probably wouldn't find out, but if mm. they did find out, it would be breaking the terms of your mortgage. Does and anybody come and check? They can do, yeah. Yeah, yeah they can check through um, you know, wh where your mail's going, for example, your, your council rates, yeah. um, electricity bills, um, bank share uh, information. So if you have your bank statement from a different bank going to that address, mm. then that the other lender could find out about that. Um, pr more than likely though, if you, if you approach the buy to let lender and told them your situation, they'd probably be okay with it. Would they? Okay. Probably. I'd, yeah. I'd say, you know, obviously it's at their discretion. I can't see any reason if it was only for three months yeah. and there was good reason for it, why they wouldn't do it. There was a case recently where a lady was divorced. She had two buy to let properties. She moved out of the family home mm. into one of her buy to lets. She didn't know she was doing anything wrong. Um, and came to us to remortgage her buy to lets. And it did cause a bit of an issue because the lender picked up that she was living in a place with a buy to let mortgage on it. Right. But through remortgaging that onto residential mortgage, the, pro the problem was solved. Okay. Um, Is it the kind of thing like, I mean, you know, if you just said, oh, sorry, 
and feign innocence and you make sure you get out the next day? Do you, is it sort of all right? Or I'd say do you get clamped in irons The, the, the difference would be prison? whether there's malice there or not. You know, whether you're doing it intentionally, what they call a, a, a backdoor by to let. Yeah. So you're trying to sort of con the system. Yeah. Or whether you've just done something you didn't know was wrong. Mm. There'd be a big difference between those two yeah. scenarios, I'd say. Ignorance is no defence, is it? That That's always been, been the way, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's no, they would say, yeah, maybe you didn't know, but you still did it. I think the key is, like you brought, said, talk to the mortgage lender. Yeah. Because yeah. actually, if you talk to them before you've done something and say, this is what I need to do, yeah. and this is what I propose, etc., yeah. invariably they will allow you to do something, but at least you didn't with their consent. And if mm. they don't allow you, then okay, you know where they stand on it. So if yeah. you then decide to still go ahead and do that, you know that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it's human instinct, isn't it? Some of us try to get away with things, but it is better mm. to do it the proper. You learn that as you get older. <laughs> um, right, I've got another question here. This person says, I made my final mortgage payment and it couldn't have come at a better time. Ooh. Now I need to remove my old partner. The sentence doesn't stop there. Now I need to remove my old partner from land registry and property ownership. I paid him for his part when we split. I got him to sign something and we got our witness to also sign. Does anyone know how I go about proceeding and will I need a solicitor? There's no mortgage on the property. So made the final mortgage payment and now she wants to remove her old partner from the land registry and property ownership. And she's paid him yep. for his part when they split up. She's going to need um, a solicitor to proceed. Um, she can go online to HM Land Registry. Mm. Uh, there'll be forms on there that need to be completed. Mm. Um, may have to go through the money laundering rigmarole, in which case she will have to see right. okay. a solicitor or conveyancer. But generally speaking, it's not, it's, it's not a painful process. I would recommend probably where there is a partner that's come off. Sounds like he's still on the deeds, but yeah. they've paid off. I would potentially go with a solicitor in the first yeah. place to yeah. make sure that you are watertight yeah, yeah. and that yeah. he can't come back and say oh, you didn't way. do something you should have done. So yeah. I think probably, whilst I don't think you have to, yeah. probably good advice to do so, I'd say. And by making sure yeah. it's done correctly, not only is it done correctly, but you can rely upon the solicitor's professional indemnity mm -hmm. insurance if something is off. done wrongly. Yeah. Okay. Right. You know, so if anything were to happen down the line, you could rely upon the advice yeah. you were to get from that solicitor. Yeah. But it's a simple process. Okay, well that's reassuring. I think it's, it's very sad, isn't it, when sort of people feel quite acrimonious about each other and the money's tied yeah, yeah. up together and it happens yeah. so often, of course, doesn't Unfortunately. it? Unfortunately. Yeah, so in fact, with that in mind, if you were advising a couple who are completely happy, but like the crit critical illness, you never know what's around the corner, what would be things that you would advise people to make sure they avoid doing or things they actively should do just to protect themselves as individuals? Don't argue. So don't argue. Say I love you before you go to bed. <laughs> yeah, these are these are life tips. Yeah. And, we and move on to a lifetime special. And, yeah. and talk the problems through. Uh, you, when you enter into something, a relationship in particular, mm. you know, buy property together, you're doing it for the long haul. If you're going into it you know, thinking this is going to fail, mm. well, sometimes it, it, things can fail as a direct result of it. And how do you really protect yourself? You know, spouses, civil law partners, have got unlimited financial dependency on, on each other. They're, you know, there are real interests. Mm. You, know, you suppose you can get into the areas of prenups, mm. you know, uh, prenuptial agreements. Uh, but when, when it comes to property, a sensible thing to do is own the property as tenants in common. Mm. And basically always have both of your names on the agreement. On yeah, the so you, and, and you each own a defined share. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you want to have something in place to say that if we split up, etc., the following happens, mm. how long the relationship will survive after you've had that conversation is another <laughs> matter. But, you, you know, consenting adults, talk it through. Yeah. Work out what it is you're really trying to achieve and then take advice to make it work. Yeah. By the same token, I think these days some people have to stay together because they can't afford to split up. Or, in the case of one couple I know, are divorced but living in the same house still. Yep, yep, happens. It works okay. It's not ideal, but it can happen, can't it? And it's, yeah, more yeah, they more. can do a declaration of trust, yep. doesn't it, which says what happens in the event of, of. Right. that. So they can yeah. do that, and actually they're quite common, really, with a lot of first-time buyers, they are quite common yeah. to, yeah. to yeah. do those. Yeah. But particularly if they're two individuals buying together, as opposed to a married couple, yes. mm. or one's put more money into it, and there's a bit of sensitivity there. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, that, that, yes, if there's maybe there's no dependents and there's very differing wages, that could be. Yep. Yeah, and very also common. people are as awkward about it as you think they might be. Because mm. actually people will quite openly talk about, well, we don't expect to, but let's yeah. do this. And actually that's the time when you get a more sensible agreement that's because true. there's no animosity. Yeah. So you agree sensibly a way that would happen. Because Tony, that's you're saying if you talk about it, you know, then it's... But actually you could go the opposite way and say, well, why wouldn't you talk about it if you're totally happy? <laughs> well, true. You know? true, true, true. So true. yeah, a few ways yeah. of looking at it. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for answering all of those questions in such detail, especially since you hadn't seen them ever before. It just shows they really are property experts. So thank you so much for joining us for this hour-long financial special of Property Question Time. My name is Gemma Forte, and I just want to thank my guests, Tony Gimple from Less Tax for Landlords, Paul Mahoney, the MD of Nova Financial, and James Jenkins, financial advisor from Money Sprite. Right, if you've got any questions you'd like different experts, or maybe the same, you never know, to answer, then please get in touch. You can email us, info at property-tv.co.uk. You can have a look at our Property TV website, or you can download our app for free. We're everywhere. Thank you so much. See you soon.